Simply Conscious presents Everyday Genius. Real life stories of everyday genius, unconventional wisdom, and inspiring transformations. Hey, Daniel Wagner here, co founder of Simply Conscious, and I'm here with Pete Craig, who is doing lots of amazing interviews for our Everyday Genius podcast. And uh, I want to just quickly query him about a guy he's been interviewing called uh, Mr. Fun PhD. I mean, it's a guy who's been studying the science of fun and he's got a book coming out next year uh, in 2021 uh, about the fun habit. So, uh, Pete, tell me a bit more about Mike Rucker. What's his name? Yeah, yeah Mike, Mike, Mike Rucker. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, this this guy captured my, my attention. I think he popped up on uh, on my Instagram feed. And I just thought, wow, you know, this is uh, this is so bizarre because we'd been talking about um, this idea of like, you know, creating from joy and creating from from happiness. Uh, so I reached out to uh, to Mike after looking at some of his content, and yeah, it's it's a fascinating subject. Yeah, to look at you know, this difference between uh, and what kicked it off for him was this this idea that yeah, he he was going through a challenging time in his life and he wanted to be happy. Um, but he couldn't be happy because there was so sadness going on mm. through the bereavement of you know, his younger brother. Um, but he also recognized that if he didn't snap out of that, that could easily kind of trail into you know, depression. Uh, so he then started looking at, okay, so what can I do to pull myself out of that? And fun is, a, fun is something that you can experience while you're sad. So you can have these moments of fun and these moments of joy despite having this you know, kind of like baseline um, sadness, this baseline mm. emotion going on. Uh, so I think that's one of the this. that's one of the key distinctions when you came off the podcast you shared with me and says, look, he doesn't say I can make you happy, but I can definitely help you have some fun. You can have fun even if you're in a bad state. You can create something and and make that habitual, but you it doesn't mean it will lead to happiness. But at least there's something happening in your brain and your endorphins in your behavior, right? And I feel that's such a great distinction because people, everyone's in the pursuit of happiness, right? But actually having a bit of fun is quite lighthearted. What I find funny, he's got a PhD and he studied the science of fun. There's a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> How was he talking to him? Did you find him really serious or was he actually quite lighthearted? No, he's, uh, he's actually quite very quite lighthearted, but you know, there's, there's also this, as an academic, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's also kind of this depth and it's something that I haven't experienced before in interviews that I've done is, you know, someone who, who can reference you know, the work that they've done and the studies that have done beforehand, uh, not from a not from the perspective of, of I've read about it or I've seen someone else talk about that, but from the perspective of I've actually researched this. Yeah, you know, I know this. I know this data. It's I know nice. this information. Yeah, you know, the science that, of fun, right? I yeah, like it. The, the, the science of fun, and he's created something called the Rucker Play Model. Oh, um, nice. And in the podcast, we'll put a link underneath so as people can actually uh, get access to that. He's kindly allowed us to. Uh, to share that with everyone so uh, yeah as a, as a first step while we wait for the book to come out check out the rocker model rocker play model and uh, and see how awesome. you can inject more fun into your life sounds awesome and uh, for anybody else if you are listening to the whole podcast i'm sure you get lots out of it and there is lots other episodes coming we're recording currently a few episodes a week and they will be released every week on simplyconscious.com and on your usual channels uh, I'm Daniel Wagner, founder of Simply Conscious, and I'm looking forward to giving you an Everyday Genius podcast with Pete Craig and Mike Rucker, the creator of The Fun Habit and Joy. And I look forward to seeing you either on another podcast or, of course, in our Facebook community. Look out for it and speak soon. Take care. Hello and welcome to this episode of Everyday Genius with Simply Conscious. I'm your host, Pete Craig, for this episode. And today... It's a real pleasure to bring someone to the show who kind of popped up uh, for me at a time when I was looking at um, looking at how joy works and looking at how um, and trying to understand and, and unpick what it is that makes me um, the most productive, what it is that gives me the most the most flow. And one of the things I recognised personally was that when I'm in a state of joy, everything else kind of follows on. And it was while I was looking at this and how this kind of plays into my everyday world that, um, that this article popped up. Um, and this guy was talking about fun and how important fun is in life. And it kind of really struck a chord for me. So I looked into it a little bit more and uh, it, it turns out that uh, 
you know, this is a, an area of study. Uh, this particular gentleman has been has been looking at the science of fun, um, and it's a real thing. Yes, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Uh, but let me just give you a quick introduction. So today's guest is uh, is Dr. Mike Rucker. Um, Mike is a peer reviewed author. He's got over a decade of kind of like experience. The interesting kind of thing that I find is that uh, he's always worked in this kind of like space of health and wellness. And, you know, it's been at the forefront of that for a number of years and was actually kind of like, you know, um, voted as one of the kind of like the top influencers, top 10 influencers in that space. Um, he'll tell us more, uh, but he's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, in Forbes and in CIO.com uh, and lots of other places. Next year, his, uh, his much awaited book is released, um, The Fun Habit. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but for now, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mike Rucker. Hello, Mike. Hey, how's it going? Uh, very good, thanks. Very good. Cool. Lovely to see you. I know it's early there, so um, thank you for taking the time to like get up and, uh, and spend this uh, uh, join us for this podcast. Of course, my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Excellent. So before we kind of like get started, I, I really want to just ask a couple of questions and these are questions that we ask uh, of ourselves each day um, sure and i find that they kind of really set set me up and every, everyone that we ask these questions to seems to seems to it makes them pause for thought um and the first one is what's what's alive in you right now uh i think this idea of um looking at how we can sort of expand people's positive, you know, valence, um, and improve emotion across the board. Um, you know, obviously it's a very interesting time, um, sort of doing all sorts of different work, uh, to prepare for the book launch. And so in informational interviews, you know, sort of the general sense of answers that I would get, you know, when you do this kind of stuff, you always get rich feedback because all of us are different, but the complete tenor of things have changed. And so um, what's driving me is the opportunity to come out of this and kind of allow people to reconnect with what's important in life. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of holding that, you know, I tend to be a bit of an empath, um, you know, and so, you know, sort of absorbing that, but also with the gratitude that things will change um, and that there's, you know, brighter horizons ahead and having the ability to kind of lift people into that, um, you know, because likely what we're in at the worst is only going to be a two or three year predicament. And I think people are so self absorbed rightfully, you know, that's not a criticism in um, the pain that they're experiencing right now. I think um, it is, you know, motivating to know that if I do the hard work, um, it will kind of be positioned to help people, um, you know, once we kind of come out of the current environment. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that, that leads me to, um, um, to a question that I hadn't thought of. Um, sure. But that's, you know, at this time, and you, you kind of opened the door for it. So at this time, are you seeing, are you seeing a different reaction from people? So, you know, with the work that you're doing, because you know, people are in this state where there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of anxiety. And yet you're, you're kind of like talking about having fun and you're kind of like, all of your work and all everything that you're doing is kind of like focused on this concept that uh, that fun is is something that we need almost kind of like secondary to to sleep in level of importance. Yeah, I think we're um, it's you know obviously we're only like five or six weeks in um, at least especially here in the states since we you know we're uh, late to the game but obviously now trying to win the first place prize. Yeah, um, is uh, the idea that you can coexist with different emotions you know um one of the nice things you know about our brain is it is hard to be in one space or the other but um one of the problems when you are sort of in crisis mode is um you know this uh, survivor's guilt or or uh, that's not really the right term because it's something different but you know this idea that i can't find joy in the moment because things are so dire and i think um, at least the people that resonate with my work, you know, in this time in particular are finding that helpful that, okay, it's okay to be worried. Um, and especially some people are in an immense amount of pain, you know, folks that have lost their job that, um, and things of that nature, economic pain, um, you know, there needs to be, uh, time 
to process that and hopefully you know um, stack your stack the deck so that you can come out of this um, okay. Um, at the same time, there's still folks around you and opportunities where you're not going to be able to be productive, and you do have a choice of how to spend those moments. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where um, that's one area, right? That you don't have to be miserable all the time, but it's okay to find joy even though right now your particular situation is, is uh, not that great. Yeah. And then the second is um, having the mind frame to take opportunity um, of what's in front of you. And so um, in particular, parents that are overwhelmed with the fact that their kids are at home, but that's gonna happen. So that's, that's a constant that they can't change. Um, and so they have the opportunity to either use those opportunities for fun or spend that time, you know, bickering and trying to use it, you know, um, in a way, you know, as a teachable moment or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously I advocate for the former because this isn't a situation that, you know, your children, um, necessarily understand, but they're certainly going to look to you as a teacher, you know, are you teaching them resilience and to make the best of, of what's in front of them? Or are you teaching them to freak out in any given situation and to just be quiet and meek? Um, and I think a lot of people sort of need that extra nudge to understand, you know, when you freak out and yell at them and tell them to be quiet, um, one, it's not that fair, um, because they're not, they didn't put themselves in this situation. It wasn't like they got suspended from school, right? Where again, maybe that would be more appropriate for a teachable lesson. Yeah. Um, but two, you're in it. So this is gonna happen and you have that choice. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it, uh, amplifies, right? Because, again, you're also teaching in that moment of how to react to any given situation. So, yeah, you, you, you kind of mentioned that, uh, you know, something there about this, you know, this ability to like, you know, have, um, you know, have these kind of like two states or these two kind of emotions going on. And that, that was something that, although I was, I was aware of, it really hit home when, you know, we had our kind of like pre, um, pre interview chat and you talked about how, you know, you can be, you started off looking at kind of like happiness um, yeah, and the, the reality is you can't be happy and sad at the same time, but you can be sad and experience fun or experience moments of joy. Yeah. And that, that for me was, um, it was an interesting reminder. Yeah. What's, is, is that, is that kind of like the, uh, the, the kind of like basis of, of, of the work for you? You know, this, this understanding or this difference between, um, yeah, a, a state like happiness and, you know, something that is perhaps more momentary, which is fun and joy. Yeah. And I think that's where I've been really geeking out. Right. So this idea of subjective happiness has kind of been made up. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an academic measure that we look at. And so, you know, oftentimes academics to sort of understand it will either give a very episodic instrument and say, hey, you know, tell me on a scale of one to seven how you're doing or they'll use technology like smartphones or beepers and sort of check in with you throughout the day, right? And so that provides some provocative information, like, <clears throat> you know, one of the most telling. Now, you know, I've kind of built up kids and what we should do. You know, the darker side of that is, I think this research was done by Dan Gilbert, is people with kids, um, you know, oftentimes uh, when you check in on them, they aren't that happy, right? So there is sort of um, this realization that, uh, uh, you know, there's some things that uh, we have a bias towards um, thinking might bring fun into our lives. And oftentimes because they, you know, that's still a responsibility might not. Um, and so this idea to get back to your question, um, you know, happiness is really just a checkbox, right? Like, you know, we think about it in that context and we sort of build it as a construct in ourselves. Um, depending where you live, you know, happiness also is reliant on a set point. So, you know, the uh, depending on your eco economic social class um, or perhaps, um, you know, your environment, you're sort of, you know, measuring your happiness against that. What I like about fun that's different is it's very um, inherent, right? And so, um, you know, you see that all the time, two children that don't even know each other and perhaps don't even speak the same language can go out and find this thing that's fairly close to flow. You know, you mentioned that at the beginning mm -hmm. um, where you're just really engaged in, um, in an experience that brings in positive emotion, 
you know, geeks like me call it valence, you know, um, and, uh, and just get that enjoyment, the gift that the universe has to give us, um, you know, that is provided that's very raw. And then if you feel necessary, you can go journal about it later. Yeah, right. Yeah. And like provide context and add words in your language, you know, that's going to sort of pervert what it really just happened because, you know, you only have a limited set of words in any given vocabulary for whatever language you speak, um, which is fine. You know, we need all of those tools to advance. Um, uh, but yeah, so th that's where I really see the delineation is like, you know, happiness is this collective of experiences that we get to ruminate on. And certainly I advocate for, um, you know, finding more fun in your life so that you can build this corpus of experiences and feel like you're happier. Mm. Um, and we know that will happen over time, right? It's clear. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Killingsworth and others that have looked at, um, you know, when you're able to index uh, more positive experiences throughout your life, you know, obviously that hat correlates with less depression and, and um, less issues of mental illness. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, one is sort of a feeling, the other is very action oriented. Yeah. Um, and it also gets your mind into the process. So I think that's, you know, one of the things in my work, um, and this is, you know, very much a self experiment, but as I was sad, um, you know, I guess just a quick backstory there was my brother passed away in 2016. So, you know, I, um, kind of need to get myself out of that situation of feeling despair about it. Cause it was kind of sudden. Um, and so, you know, episodically finding ways to, um, have fun, um, and not skirt per se, um, the fact that this bad thing had happened to me, um, but create an index of things that I had to look back on and realize that I had more agency than I thought about how I do spend my time instead of this sort of philosophical understanding of what happiness was and why I wasn't happy. Um, I think that's the difference, right? Is that there's one that's a result and then there's one that's a process that can be ongoing that you can, you know, really find a lot of pleasure and enjoyment in. Um, and so I choose the latter. Yeah. Cool. Um, this, the, as, as you've been talking, this one kind of like just, just popped into my head and that's, is there a, so when you, when we think about, um, the, the, the way we construct kind of our lives in, a, in our heads is, is kind of like very linear. So we use memory, you know, to create this linear um, kind of like process and history that we can reflect back on. Um, and you, you, kind of, you stated there, you know, that happiness is, is to a large degree predicated on our interpretation of those things. Is, is, there, is there something that, or have you found within your research that, that would indicate that actually fun is less based on the experience of fun is more um, of a feeling more experiential. So rather than kind of like memory based, so yeah, it's, it's almost like being in that flow state. Do you, do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's kind of, like, there's one thing that's based a lot on, on memory and on looking back. And the other one is just kind of like there it's you experience it and yet you don't experience it. It's more, it's all encompassing rather than a mental construct. Yeah. And no, that's, that's exactly right. So, um, so most of emotion is going to need to be evaluated, right? And so, but you've hit the nail on the head. The reason that I do like this with regards to dialogue about how we can live lives where we do find more joy is that it is very much in the moment, right? And so oftentimes, you know, when I'll get deep in the weeds in conversations like this, it's um, like one of the anecdotes I like to bring up is, uh, as a graduate student, I was in Zambia doing some work, you know, talking about the differences between the lives of Zambians and myself with some Zambians. Um, and, you know, they wanted to know about all the luxuries of, of the U.S. And, and we were certainly talking about some of the problems within the country. Um, and we weren't feeling very good about it because it wasn't a really, you know, uh, fun conversation. Um, and after that, we picked up a game of soccer um, and it wasn't a real game. We were just, you know, it kind of changed the mood because it was an enjoyable experience, a shared experience. There wasn't too much verbal communication. Um, and then we went out and we had fun because we had this communal experience between us. Um, and then so folks that sort of want to poke holes in that are like, well, but soccer still has rules. You know, there were still these things that sort of bound. So fun isn't as 
expansive and abundant as I think you initially say. And I would disagree with that. I think um, some of my research for the book, I've gone to these um, uh, children's museums, uh, you know, th these places where kids are allowed uh, experiential play. Um, and you can tell the difference between uh, how kids who just, you know, clearly have a lot more fun than adults, yeah. um, at least in our, you know, current society, um, will go and run and immediately have fun. They don't need meaning making yet, and they don't really need to know the rules because they'll start to um, organize those rules, you know, based on these agreements with people they've never met, where adults are paralyzed when they get in there waiting for someone to give them instructions. So, you know, back to that experience in Africa, yeah, okay, so soccer has rules because, you know, they're sort of social norms and we understood them, but they didn't necessarily make that game, you know, any better or worse, right? It was just something that we had agreed upon. Um, and so it's really hard for adult brains to go back and go, oh yeah, I remember in the park, I didn't really know what soccer was. I just knew that if I kicked this ball, it was fun. Yeah. And you can see animals play with balls all the time, right? And so we sort of, um, we are meaning makers as humans, right? So we want to you know, put some bounds around it that could potentially make it more fun. Um, but all of those are happening in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can evaluate something um, to make better choices. But to your point, that's you know, sort of um, at a later time. And oftentimes overthinking that kind of stuff isn't fun, right? Another good example are um, in vacation studies, folks that sort of overthink the fun they're going to have in an upcoming vacation yeah. versus people that are just sort of live in the moment. So as things, you know, um, ebb and flow, they're like, okay, you know, and sort of adjust. Um, the folks that uh, future think and then uh, ruminate on their vacation have, a, you know, a lot less fun than the folks that are actually, you know, engaging in the experience and realizing like if the experience is, um, really that opportunity and not the way that you think about it. Yeah. Um, so there is these huge ego aspects to, um, you know, using it as a tool that are important mm -hmm. because, um, yes, it very much is in the now as Tolly would say. Um, I hope that answers your question, yeah, but yeah, it is. No, no, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> How, um, So it's, it, sound, it sounds like you know your uh, your research is suggesting that you know as humans we've we've forgotten how to how to have fun we've forgotten how to you know access that place and I'm glad you brought up that example of like you know the study in the in the museums because I was listening to another interview that you'd done and you talked about exactly that about how you know kids will just go in and start stacking the blocks up in in random collect formations whereas the adults will just won't do anything until they're told the guidelines of how to function in that environment. Uh, so yeah, is there, what's, what's the evidence that supports, you know, from a, yeah, a, I guess from a psychological perspective, you know, how we, how we change. So, um, the most important piece to this is our fear of being judged, right? So this is one that I can't take credit for, but, um, is, um, often used in the context to highlight uh, what you just asked um, in a in a great way. So I hope to do it once and get it filmed, um, but I can't take credit for it right now. Uh, I think um, the who I saw do it in person is David Kelly from IDEO. Um, but the exercise is you get a bunch of people in a room that have never met each other, so generally like at a conference or a TED Talk or something of that nature, um, and you have each other, you pair up, you know, with preferably someone that you've never met. Um, and you do the fun uh, sort of exercise of drawing the other person. Yeah. And so you don't really know why you're doing it, but most people love to draw. You know, I think there are these like sort of commonalities of, um, you know, one thing isn't always fun for everyone, but for whatever reason, drawing and dancing yeah. seem to be fairly communal. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, anyway, so uh, you draw this caricature of your neighbor and then you're surprised to find out that you have to show it to the other person, right? And so the first thing that adults do, um, you know, a as a majority, so not everyone, but most of the people in the audience, the first thing they'll say to their partner is, I'm sorry. Even though everyone's smiling and the you know, exercise was super enjoyable, at that moment, they are so afraid of being judged, um, you know, no, no matter how good the, the character was. Kids 
will just openly, you know, just start giggling and like sharing and like, this is so fun, yeah. you know, like, look what I did. And so, um, you know, that, the, what that exercise highlights is that we're all just afraid of like, you know, because our realities, um, they call it, you know, the looking glass are sort of, uh, as we age, get built on the perceptions of others and not necessarily what we feel is important. So sort of some of the more advanced topics of, uh, of the work that I'm doing is, you know, how do you do that on multiple scales? How do you not, especially with strangers, how do you not necessarily, as long as you're not doing anything in malice, right, so that you're going to hold some sort of guilt, how do you, you know, really immerse yourself in that experience and take all the joy that you deserve from it rather than worrying about something where clearly after that intervention, you realize they didn't care either. They thought it was funny, yeah. right? No one's going to be mad at you about the character that you draw them. Um, and then the second is how do you, how do you mitigate the fact that, uh, you know, for us, subjective happiness is so dependent on a reference point mm -hmm. and take control over that. So, um, and even that one is difficult. I mean, that's something that's an ongoing process for me and I've been living this right now for half a decade, yeah. um, you know, is okay. We are predisposed to having to live up to the Joneses and that, you know, that data yeah. is not just social psychology. I meant, you know, yeah. Uh, it's very much uh, marketing as well. And we use those tools and marketers all the time, right? Yeah. Um, but we do have agency once we're aware of it to be like, okay, I don't, I can still say that I want these things, but what do I want in comparison to like me, not, mm -hmm. you know, my neighbor. Yeah. Um, and that has huge benefit for obvious reasons, yeah. you know, because then you're living a deliberate life and not necessarily, you know, letting life sort of dictate what you feel is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I think um, we, we all we all have these um, these views or these thoughts of what people are going to think uh, of how people are going to judge. And Brené Brown talks talks about this. You know, the story I'm telling myself you know, when when someone doesn't react in the way that you you expect them to react. Um, it's not because there's anything wrong. It's not, but we play a story within our own heads that says something different, you know, which kind of like is exactly what you, you've just been saying. You know, we have this fear um, and we build this fear up into something that debilitates us and makes us react in certain ways that, that aren't in, that aren't in joy. They, they suppress that. Um, they suppress that fun. They suppress, suppress that ability to just be in the moment and express ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And in an unauthentic way, unfortunately, yeah. you know, because then all of a sudden we separate the I from me, mm. right? And we're living up to something that's not, you know, again, is subjectively created and not necessarily deeply inherent, which is a shame. Yeah. And then that's, you know, a little bit above my pay grade with regards to my <laughs> understanding. But I, those deep divides, um, you know, I, I think have been shown to, uh, you know, elicit despair because there is that dissidence, right? What I know more intimately, feel more qualified to talk about is, um, you know, especially when we start to use subjective measures as a gauge, you know, um, I have looked at uh, when we start to measure the gap between the distance of where we're, who we, we believe we are and who we want to be, um, then all of a sudden we identify with the person that, um, you know, the, the current state of our identity. Yeah. And that can make us feel like the other is not achievable and people will give up, um, which is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So another reason that I really like this construct of fun is that, again, it's not results oriented. You know, it's this process that, okay, so you might not necessarily be where you wanna be, like back in 2016, I wanted to be happy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that just wasn't gonna happen. So what step can I take today? Um, and then I just really start enjoying that process. Well, you know what? Having a little bit of fun is a lot better than not. So yeah. let me do that again tomorrow. Let me do that again tomorrow. And then, you know, sooner or later I felt healed rather than, you know, looking in, across this big chasm of like, holy shit, man, this, how am I going to get through this? Yeah. You know? So, so, you know, I just, I just want to like go back to that because I was, it was my intention to go like, you know, talk about the, the backstory um sure you know, what, what no triggered problem. all of this um but we kind of like went in <laughs> went it went in deep straight away which i which i love um but you've kind of like lived uh lived your research yourself haven't you you've kind of like been your own 
to a large degree your own your own guinea pig. Yeah, I mean, and the backstory isn't that important unless people feel like they want to be connected to how this kind of came about. But I mean, so the short version is it just had a lot of bad stuff happen mm -hmm. all at once. Um, and uh, before that point, um, you know, I had done a ton of research and sort of was part of um, the infancy of the positive psych movement. So I had, you know, understood what, um, you know, some of these basic interventions for happiness and they had worked pretty well up until that point. But I got so, you know, knocked on my butt with my brother dying. And then, uh, um, you know, I had been an avid uh, triathlete and found out that uh, I had to get a hip replacement, which uh, means I haven't run really competitively since then. Um, and then uh, we ended up getting relocated by an opportunity my wife had. So we left all our friends and family. Mm -hmm. And so all these, you know, uh, you know, think pro social behaviors that we had that were sort of, you know, lifting me up, um, you know, the ability to stay healthy and sort of engage in yeah. the identity of a runner and stay well that way. Um, and then obviously this intimate understanding that time is a lot more finite than I had given it credit. Um, you know, these, these tools that I had at my disposal just weren't working. And so, um, you know, that's that's kind of what led to this path is that there was no way for me to um, sort of orchestrate uh, um, a, a way to get me happy. Um, but I was sick of kind of living in negative valence and always sort of feeling sad. Um, and so that was the, the beginning of this journey. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as I got into it, realizing that, uh, you know, we're just not talking about it enough. Mm -hmm. And so. What I find really interesting now um, in the context of it, you know, we talked about sleep a little bit and how that's, you know, all of these ideas kind of ebb and flow, which is good, right? Because, yeah. you know, we can't really understand everything in life, <laughs> right? We've got to pick what's important. Um, and so our experiences, you know, if you want to boil it down to its essence, are really two things, right? They're the event and then the way that we interpret the event. Yeah. and. There, you know, you mentioned Benet Brown. Um, there's a whole host of folks, you know, both Sam Harris and Dan Harris, and all, you know, people that are talking about savoring and mindfulness. The way that we sort of perceive our experiences, I feel like there's some really, really good thought leadership, that, you know, behind that, and with a lot of different philosophies that you can kind of pick from for what works with you. Um, but there's not enough of us talking about the agency that we have for the events in our life, especially right now, you know, with the who coming out last year, obviously the who is immersed in some other issues right now, but last year the big topic was burnout. And that's because we are over prescribed, right? We've over prescribed our children. We've over prescribed ourselves. Um, you know, there's, uh, as adults are living longer, you know, uh, folks my age are living in the, you know, what they call the sandwich generation. So not only are we the primary caregivers for our children, but also our adults. Yeah. And um, so we've completely devalued self-care, right? Um, and so there needs to be this reminder, even though it's pretty rudimentary, that we do have a little bit more agency than we think um, to intermix these quote unquote events, you know, in our 168 hours in our week. Um, and so that's what I love, you know, these kind of, when you can boil something down to a simple nudge where like, oh, wow, you know, just two out of those 168 hours, if I take them back for myself, that's really all I need, right? Yeah. Sleep's the same way, right? Like if you're, if you're sleeping six hours, you know, what's that, 42 hours a week, and then you're just, you know, you add back in 14 hours to that, like that makes all the difference. Everything yeah. just starts to blossom, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, even more, uh, you know, it should be intuitive, but the same thing, you know, is for, you know, feeling some sort of self-worth with your own time. Mm -hmm. And the reason that this is another thing that I like about fun more than happiness is that a lot of folks that do kind of find practical nonfiction to, you know, self-help, whatever you want to call it, um, to find happiness, those tend to be fairly um, inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Like we need, you know, those kind of messages like, you know, you need to work on yourself before you can work on other people, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. And I don't really, you know, want, want to, uh, to convey an opinion about that approach. But what I do like about fun that it, it appeals to me is that when you deploy some of these interventions, 
especially if you're extroverted, they invite other folks in. Yeah. So they tend to be, um, you know, they have this multiplying effect of where you're finding joy, but also the people around you are, um, you know, and, uh, and as we've talked about, it's, it's fairly clear from the literature that if you can instill pro-social behavior, that also is a rising tide. Um, so that's why I like it more than, you know, some of these things that tend to be more introspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you're not really helping anyone else out yeah. besides yourself. Um, so I'm not saying that those are selfish by any nature, but I'm saying if you do have the choice, why not choose one that, you know, it's also going to sort of, um, you know, have these interesting side effects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, those just, just a simple act of, um, you know, smiling at someone, you know, that, that, that smile kind of like for no, for no reason causes, causes the other person to smile and that act of smiling, you know, it's been, it's been studied, you know, no end of times, you know, that just simply the guy the act of smiling changes um changes your body chemistry and improves your your mood so just that one simple thing that one simple interaction with one other person you know makes a makes a huge difference and i think a lot of a lot of what we've done and social media perhaps hasn't ha hasn't helped with this um is we've lost the ability to connect with other people you know we we've become much more insular we've become much more guarded about our our emotions um and about how we share um you know how we feel yeah and, and, yeah. That, and that includes that includes fun no that's exactly right um so i don't think this is a tangent but i'm gonna bring it up because it's one of the funner interventions like so on the happiness track right the the big one that's talked about quite a bit is this gratitude letter which i think is great especially because um, it, it, in an essence, it's one that sort of touches with stuff that I advocate, you know, this idea that you, you know, write a letter of gratitude to someone, um, and then you actually go and visit them and read it out loud. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Marty Segelman, I think is the one that's done a lot of work in that um, particular area. Um, but the one that I like, you know, that's more in line with sort of my narrative is, um, work out of, uh, Virginia, the, uh, professor, uh, Timothy Wilson, where you buy a gift for somebody, um, you know, kind of like Secret Santa, and you give it to them, but you don't tell them who it's from. So we know that gift giving kind of has this, you know, we talk about all the time, right? Like random acts of kindness, yeah. that's been well studied. You know, you pay for the toll um, behind you. But uh, what Dr. Wilson found is that if you don't tell somebody who, you know, you, you, you do it anonymously so they don't know um, but there is obviously like uh, aspects of the gift that where they know it, it wasn't just a random stranger yeah. so that they have to guess who it was and you never tell them. You sort of expand the benefit of that because talk about a fun intervention, right? It's fun to get a gift. You accept it. And then, you know, that, that the joy from that, you know, tends to be fairly episodic. Mm -hmm. But if the person has to continue, you know, throughout a longer duration to kind of, um, uh, you know, so you, you end up uh, getting a lot more. And so that's one um, I just love that that concept and the fact that it has been studied because it makes sense again, right? And it's one of those things where you take something that's kind of fun and then you make it a lot more fun, yeah. Um, just because you know you don't. There's no conclusion to it, right? There's a little bit of mystery and wonder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's a there's another side to that as well as you know from the perspective of the giver. Um, you know, there's no there's then no you remove this. Um, you call it expectation of response, Correct. You know, which yeah. which can be good or can be bad. Yeah, you know? because again, we play this we play this story in our heads of how we expect that person to receive that gift, and if it's not how we how we've perceived it, how we've played it in our minds, you know, then again, that changes our experience of that gift giving um, process. No, absolutely. I think uh, there is a whole other side to it that if you um, if it brings you a bit of displeasure. Um, to not, you know, for the recipient not to know it's you, there might be some room for self-evaluation mm. of why that yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because then it wasn't really a gift, yeah. right? Yeah. It was an exchange, yeah. you know? <laughs> I, I know. I know when we first talked, you, you kind of said that when you first started looking at this, there wasn't a great deal of research. Um, is, that, is that changing? You know, are you starting to see, you know, a bigger impact, a wider impact of, yeah, the work you're doing and, and the work that other people are doing in this class in a similar area? So, no, um, I think it, 
you know, when I'm talking with other academics, what I'm finding um, is there certainly like a growing interest, but, uh, you know, sort of want, wanting to understand, um, you know, if it's already been covered. So uh, I think I make a strong case it hasn't, but some people talk about it in terms of engagement, but engagement can still be there without the construct of positive valence. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people want to spin it towards more uh, hedonistic philosophy. And that's, you know, that's there for yeah. people that, uh, um, you know, kind of want to understand pleasure better, but pleasure and fun are certainly two different mm -hmm. things. Um, and then, you know, the construct of flow, I think um, another sort of scary thing to folks is that fun is a way to uh, engage in flow without uh, the needed sort of additional aspect of mastery that Cheek Sent Me High talks about. So I think it confuses folks as well. Um, but it's, you know, it's definitely gaining steam. And I think, uh, you know, this idea of how we look at leisure, especially with social media, um, uh, you know, is gaining importance and it can be applied so many different places. That's another, you know, problem with pure science is that it often has to uh, and I, 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 this isn't a critical um, viewpoint. It's more just this is how good science works, right? Is that you do need um, some reductionism so that you can, you know, have further study. Yeah. And I think that's where I've uh, chosen to take advantage of the fact that I'm writing a book and not, you know, publishing this particular, um, uh, you know, thought uh, process. Um, because that gives me a little bit of creative license to coalesce all of the available science, you know, and then people can take pieces away from it and decide whether or not they want to empirically test it. Um, but, you know, I, I've brought together 300 plus different studies to sort of make my arguments. And um, so we'll see where it goes, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Because I, I, I think where I've been watching things unfold right now um, because fun is an emotional state right i mean in essence it's anything that has positive valence yeah. right and so there's a lot of work being done right now on um on emotion and so i'm kind of sitting on the sidelines to see how that unfolds yeah. um and you know this idea of arousal and valence and then you know are emotions really feelings or is it something separate mm -hmm. and so because I'm taking an action oriented approach, I'm like, okay, you know, you guys figure that out at the same time. Let's still advocate for the fact that we do have agency to feel a lot better than we are right now, yeah. you know, because that that's important. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something I want to like just, just touch on as well. Cause I know it's a, um, it, I think, I think it's still relevant. It's still relevant. Sure. Um, and you talk, you've, you've written a couple of articles about it and, uh, we mentioned it just before we started the call and that's kind of like, yeah, this, this culture of call it hustle, um, and uh, you know, especially within within the business call it environment and the startup space, and you know, so many people call it aspiring to be like you know the uh, um, like the influencers who you know who bang that drum. You know, sure. How much of a how much of a negative impact do you think that's had on um, on us? So, it's I think. What it's done is created, um, you know, sort of some false promises. So the one thing that, you know, when you boil down uh, mastery or, uh, you know, celebrating our heroes within a meme, you don't show the backstory, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, you know, in regards to things that are very digestible, um, oftentimes the people that, uh, you know, do well communicating the perils of this show the iceberg right so you you know um i guess will cure bad memes with good memes right so the meme is this iceberg and it shows you know the tip above the water um and like you know these are the you know the um uh, entrepreneurs or sports heroes that we champion and then below the water is that huge iceberg of folks that really aren't you know so uh, we have this bias to celebrate, you know, folks that win and that's what we take in because, you know, we do, uh, you know, uh, we all aspire to be something bigger than mm -hmm. ourselves, which is great. Um, but at the end of the day, even if you want to go down that path, because I certainly wouldn't want to, uh, 
curtail anyone from you know pursuing their dreams. But what we now know is that most people that run on a nine or a ten, um, you know, uh, with regards to output, yeah. uh, generally will burn out, yeah. um, and that the folks that can kind of stay at a seven or eight um, over time end up producing a lot more. And so yeah. this idea um, that you should always redline intuitively we should know right that, that is um, a bad protocol mm -hmm. um, but ultimately we see come to it because these things are so prevalent because they're exciting yeah. right um, and I forgot if I shared in our pre-interview or not but we certainly know this um, on the fitness side too which I'm immersed in in my day job yeah you know they call it fitspro right and so you know you hold up this ideal of someone that has um, you know that's a very small percentage of segment that, you know, because of either, uh, um, you know, uh, luck of the draw with genetics or things of that nature, or, uh, you know, the Kardashians openly admit that a lot of that has to do with surgery, mm -hmm. you know, things that are never achievable through normal means, um, you know, you, you sort of get that, uh, you know, you're digesting those images and this ideology yeah. day after day, you start to believe it. Um, and so the same is with business, right? You have these folks that are churning this out. You, you believe that they're the ones doing it, where if you peel back the curtain, you know, it's actually a huge team. Yeah. And oftentimes they're not actually even doing what they preach. Um, the one person that I think, um, and it makes sense to me because he would, I met him and he's such a good guy that has kind of uh, reversed courses, Gary V. I mean, he's a you know, um, I actually loved his stuff in the 90s when I was not doing anything but just living in my office. And, he, you know, even he now is like, hey, I think we've taken this a little too far. Um, but you have, uh, who's it, uh, from 37 Signals, Friedman. Um, you have the gentleman from Reddit. Uh, you know, all these folks are coming out now and going, look, you know, I these are my brethren. And I see the folks that, um, you know, are living this life are the ones that aren't making it. So it's good, I think. Um, in that respect, there are finally some some folks that are saying, you know, you, you've been duped and yeah. you need to. Um, and it also. Yeah, I don't want to ramble about it, but I, I have faith in millennials and Gen Z. I, I think they are also better at seeing through it yeah. than than my generation Absolutely. was. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I think that that is perhaps the, the one thing that that I see more and more is that um, and I was talking to someone yesterday about about this thing yeah, that the people are much more aware, you know, the, the younger generations are much more aware and much more in tune, you know, and they see through, um, you know, a lot of the, the BS that, you know, that perhaps we bought into, you know, years and years ago, you know, even you know, when you think about like how businesses operate from a sales perspective, you know, a lot of that was kind of like, you know, manufactured, you know, it was the use of heavy, heavy use of kind of like NLP in a, in a manipulative way rather than a, a supportive way. Um, and, now more and more you know those generations are th seeing through that and it's kind of like forcing this uh this move towards you know authentic kind of like communication towards you know kind of like transparent you know communication and almost kind of like wearing your heart um where it's meant to be not on your sleeve um and and communicating from that point yeah it's interesting though and this is really going to get us off track and so <laughs> maybe uh, i'll but I'm I'm struggling with that a bit um, because I do think the problem is when you're so independent, uh, then you you know these social nets become less effective. And so where you know I, I kind of spent a little bit of time is um, you know I love that individuality, right? I obviously just championed it. I mm -hmm. think it's important, right? And it it certainly is a great tool to mitigate. Like if you're not overly concerned about what your neighbor thinks about you, then you're going to, you know, allow yourself to enjoy a lot of other yeah. things and also have some independence about, um, you know, what you value. Um, but at the same time, when you're overly independent, that does foster things like the gig economy, um, you know, because everyone is an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, and then that point, then, you know, it does lend itself to believing time is money instead of time is opportunity yeah. and you start to make weird choices. And at the same time, you're also left your own devices when things like COVID hit. Yeah. You know, and so it will be interesting to see sort of how millennials and Gen Z recover from this yeah. because a lot are hurting, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, they were, uh, you know, the whole, 
side hustle culture yeah. was alive and well. And now, you know, my understanding is a lot of these folks, you know, were running on 30, 60 day reserves yeah. that are going to, you know, um, run out by the end of next month. Yeah. Um, especially in San Francisco that just said they're not going to open till June 1st, you know, where a lot of this, mm-hmm. you know, really, um, you know, it's a big epicenter of that Absolutely, type of yeah. culture. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, for sure. It's going to be interesting. Um, words of wisdom. <laughs> uh, in what regard? Um, I mean, I'm guessing if, if there was, if there was one thing, you know, from, you know, your study, you know, one, one collect piece of, um, information, one, one thing that you've uncovered, um, that you'd like to, that you'd want to share with someone that, that is kind of like, yeah, cause there's a, there's always a lot of, there's a lot of pieces of advice. There's a lot of kind of like levels of understanding, but if there was one thing, you know, that you could say to someone, look, just grasp this, take this away and try and implement this. And this will help you have more fun or this will yeah, help you do something differently to the way you're doing it now. What would that be? Yeah. So that one's fairly easy. Um, so, I think boiled down to its essence is having a bias towards fun, you know, like looking at any given moment and saying, you know, not necessarily making it a chore where like, how do I make every moment in my life a little bit more fun? But, um, you know, looking at any opportunity um, as a way uh, to make it a little bit better. Right. So a great example is if you're sort of, you know, week after week going, you know, why am I eating lunch? all by myself in the, you know, the cafeteria again, like realizing that you have a little bit of agency to just reach out to a friend that's probably mm-hmm. feeling the same way you are and saying, let's go have coffee. Or if nothing else, like using that time to um, go walk and listen to an audio book or whatever it is. Um, and then uh, the same thing, like tra- challenging some of your ideals. So again, you know, this wisdom of a bias towards fun, um, you know, one of the examples I like uh, to use. And again, you know, empirically backed is this idea that as adults, um, we think that certain activities, you know, can't happen on a weekend, um, <laughs> excuse me, or a weekday. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, challenging some of these heuristics and habitual behavior we have where you can just sort of make small adjustments and, ha- and have a lot of fun. Um, so one of the things that my wife and I did, uh, we realized that, uh, you know, we, some of our friends were able to afford uh, full-time care and we never could. So that was just something that wasn't going to happen. Um, but at the end of the day, there were some, uh, you know, some things of uh, duties as parents that uh, weren't bringing our kids joy or us joy, primarily uh, um, uh, the, the bathing ritual, um, which if you have a full-time nanny, it's not that big of a deal, but to have, uh, you know, a socially acceptable sort of understanding is that it is a little bit weird to have, you know, a transient babysitter do that duty. Yeah. And we're like, wow, that's just kind of a, this social agreement, like what's different from someone that only comes over six hours, you know, a week versus 40, because we can't afford the 40. Yeah. Um, and so we just made that adjustment. We found someone that, uh, you know, we trusted um, and, you know, basically in increments bought what we could afford. Um, and then started having dates together. And so the kids absolutely loved this person and, you know, got time away from us. We got time together and reconnected as a couple. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't just like this episodic opportunity for fun um, because we sort of had this bias and we're looking for these opportunities in our life. We got a little bit creative, challenged some, uh-huh. you know, social norms. And now, um, you know, up until COVID had this, you know, amazing opportunity to um, rekindle our relationship and again, our kids were better for it because, you know, we introduced the, you know, a new stimuli into the house that they absolutely, you know, that had the type of energy to foster, yeah. you know, fun and play in an environment that they wanted. So, um, yeah. You know. yeah. Anyways, bias towards fun. That's yeah. my wisdom. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I love that. And I love the fact that actually just by, yeah, that very act, not only is it kind of like brought, you know, um, had a positive benefit for, for you and your wife, but it's also then had a positive impact on, you know, on the kids and it's allowed them to experience a different kind of fun. Uh, and it's almost like, you know, through your actions, this is, this is kind of like leadership, um, from, uh, leadership from, uh, from the front is, you know, you're, you're demonstrating how, you know, having that you know, kind of ability to, and my, my business partner refers to this as kind of like 
permission to change your mind. You know, <laughs> um, by doing that, you're almost like yeah, giving them permission to to have more fun as well, and giving them permission to explore the boundaries of you know what um, what is deemed quite acceptable by yep. whoever. You know, yep. yeah, these are these are rules that someone made up but don't necessarily fit. Well, and it all involves a little bit of risk too, right? Like I don't, I always, um, you know, it pains me a little bit to think that people think I'm marginalizing, um, that, you know, some of this, you know, if, if your ethos is inherent safety, right? Like certainly, you know, the one thing when folks come out and I guess maybe it's part of the necessity of, of branding or, or whatever, you know, that some of, uh, you know, what we say is going to be applied to all folks. Like, you know, I get it, you know, fun night might not be for everyone. You know, there's certainly, um, you know, I'm sure folks that love goth would probably never even listen to this podcast. Yeah. Right. And they're great people. And like, so there's probably a system for them. Um, I think what's important when you look at any of this stuff is that it is a process and you're allowed to pull the meat from the bone. Mm -hmm. You know, some things might not mesh with the way that you want to live your life. And I'm so, I'm certainly not asking anyone to change, um, you know, uh, aspects of themselves that are in, you know, in line with their identity. Right. Yeah, but yeah. certainly I think the one thing that we all, you know, most of us as a generality do want to, you know, feel this quote unquote, uh, greater happiness in our lives and having, and because fun is such a broad spectrum of how to do it, like all, you know, really all it entails is finding ways to increase positive valence, um, you know, that gives anyone an opportunity to do just that. And that's why I like it so much. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, and just to wrap up, um, so I shared with you our, um, our kind of like 10 ways to access your inner wisdom and ignite your, your genius. Um, what's the, which of those kind of like really stood out to you? Which, will, which of those resonates um, with you? Or yeah, it may be one, it may be two, it may be none. <laughs> no, no, I, I liked them all. Um, I think uh, Get Real was definitely, you know, part yeah. and parcel with all the stuff that we talked about, right? You know, really understanding are these choices yours or yeah. are they ones that you're making, you know, based on pre-existing heuristics that were probably developed, you know, from folks outside of, uh, you know, that are part of your external environment yeah. and, you know, part of your own identity, um, you know, and then, you know, the, uh, what we just spoke about is very much in line with that. Right. So yeah. I really like that one. Um, and then get up and out is, you know, yeah. I mean, pretty much a, uh, a, a necessity with regards to having a bias towards fun. Right. Sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, that's where, when you pepper these types of experiences and bring in, that's where real wisdom comes from. And I think, you know, even if you're an introvert, um, uh, you know, or someone that doesn't necessarily feel like they need a, a wide breadth of different experiences, the ability to just get outside, um, you know, and, and find things so that you can, you know, build this corpus of um, different experiences, different wisdom from other folks, uh, you know, and, and just a broader breadth of information to kind of develop your worldview is so important. Yeah. It doesn't matter really where you lie or if you don't think fun's important, you know, um, doing that work uh, is, you know, where growth lies. So I feel like it's super important. That might be the one that resonated with me the most. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> um, well, I did want to go into something else, but I think what I'll do is I'll ask you to, because uh, I'm conscious of time, um, and I want to keep this short and engaging for, for people. Uh, but I'd love to, in the show notes, just be able to like put your perhaps your top five tips for or processes for getting back into fun, or unless you've got that kind of on, on your website somewhere that we can point people to. Uh, but just so as people have got a start point until your book comes out. Yeah. And then when the book comes out, they can read that and they can take what they want. But for now, yeah, if you can share with me kind of afterwards those those top five things, and we'll post those into the into the show notes as well. Yeah, definitely. I think you know one of the things that I've advocated early, and so I don't talk about it that much, just but uh, I certainly will share it with your audience. Is that this idea of the the play model? So it's basically a way to sort of evaluate how you're spending time in any given week, and then uh, you know index sort of your habitual behavior and then use it as a tool to change. So I'm happy to share that with That's you and your audience. 
Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, for taking time to to talk to us this morning. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm uh, yeah, I'm excited to kind of just keep following uh, you, following the progress of uh, your research, and to reading the book when it comes out as well. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. My pleasure. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, bye, Pete. Yeah, take care. For more real life stories of everyday genius, unconventional wisdom, and inspiring transformations. Subscribe to our podcast or go to simplyconscious.com. Get more out of life.